Okay, a very good morning. It is Wednesday, the 6th of January of 2021. And first actual video briefing of this year. So apologies for the audio only up until this point. But I have a special guest, our head of trading, Piers Curran. Piers, how morning. are you doing? Very good, thanks. Good stuff. Um, so what I thought would be uh, a good thing to do here is to really get your opinion on a couple of key themes, but incorporate that around what I'd normally do for a briefing, which is focus on some of the major themes that are happening that are important for markets at the open this morning. So um, we've got a little bit of discussion about COVID, both in the UK and Europe. I'll get you up to speed on what some of the latest headlines are, and it'll be good to see your take on the kind of vaccine rollout, things of that nature. Uh, we've got the Georgia Senate runoff, and that has had a meaningful impact actually on markets this morning because T notes are, are down about 16 and a half ticks, which is a pretty decent move actually in the overnight session. And the Nasdaq's a little bit underperforming comparative to, you know, the Dow's up 127, the Nasdaq's down 156, which I thought it's quite an interesting move, which a lot of people are anticipating if the Dems win, which we can discuss in a moment, and then talk about a, little bit, a little bit about OPEC. Uh, and a surprise announcement out of the Saudis uh, yesterday. So that's what's on the agenda. Um, so kicking things off then, uh, we're gonna stru- jump straight into the Georgia Senate runoff, because I think that's the most meaningful thing that's developed really overnight. And as I said, there's been a bit of reaction seen in, in different asset classes here. So to get everyone up to speed, the Democrat Raphael Warnock edged ahead of the incumbent Senator Kelly Lofflier in one of Georgia's two Senate runoffs. Uh, It's looking pretty good for Warnock at the moment, 50.4 to 49.6% is the split at the moment. It seems awfully close, but actually uh, in in this world for for this type of subject matter, that's looking fairly as conclusive as it it can in the political world of 2020 and 2021. Um, John Ossoff, the Democrat seeking to unseat David uh, Purdue trailed the incumbent by absolute whisker. It's, it's kind of like a thousand votes at the moment. So it's basically 50 50. The latest I've seen now is a couple of the agencies have declared actually the Dems have won both. However, the final result is yet to be known. And kind of like Trump and Biden, as we know last year, it could take a little bit of time for definitive confirmation. Um, some strategists have argued that a Democratic double win. This kind of goes back down to this blue wave idea, additional stimulus, tax hikes, regulatory change. And so really want to get your take on that and what you think about what this could mean going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's quite definitely key with with that with that final remaining seat. I think even though it's a whisker, I think the the counties that are remaining to kind of declare are, are kind of more democratic leading, which is why. You're getting people now saying, right, actually, we are going to get this 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 blue wave, so to speak. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's look at the charts because I think that the most important chart, I'm just going to bring up um, chart T notes here. Um, and, and we'll have a look at the NASDAQ in a minute. Um, this is really important for me. I mean, as you can see, quite uh, another kind of extent. We had, a, we had a big move lower yesterday, but obviously that was still within the ranges of, of the uh the, the kind of christmas slash new year week um but a real stretch lower today and, and and as we break down below that low that we had on the 23rd of december then you can see it's a massive level here this key key level is the november low and, and the other thing we're looking at price here the other thing that's really important is that this is one percent um on on yield so as price prices drop yields are rising so we're we're hitting the one percent handle just to get this in perspective because this looks incredibly negative here but, but if I just go to a, a longer time period, you know, do understand that this is actually just the, this is the bottom of the sort of relatively tight consolidation phase that we've had since the big explosion higher that we had put earlier in the year off, off, off the off, off obviously onset of the pandemic. And so this is really key because it's not just that November low there, but you know, you got this low from back in June as well. And this is really important. And if we get a break here, then 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 this will get interesting. And it get interesting for a number of factors. Um, and the reason why we're getting this this move is that whole idea of the blue wave. It's as you were saying, it's the bigger stimulus package that the Democrats will be able to get through Congress without the Republicans being able to block it. Obviously, got then other issues about perhaps some um, regulatory factors coming in, and maybe maybe higher taxes further down the line. Um, to kind of pay for all this stimulus. Of course, this means more borrowing 
Uh, there'll be more supply of, of T notes. This is helping to push prices lower. But with, with regards from a yield point of view, it's that whole, that whole inflationary story comes back to the fore, right? People were talking about this around the election time. If there's a blue wave Biden win, then this with a, with a bigger stimulus, this will help to fuel a reflation story as we go through 2020 and 2021. And indeed, actually, um, the, the 10 year break even inflation um, rate at the moment has just gone, uh, gone to a new two year high uh, this morning. So you're just getting a little bit of a, a re sort of uh, attention back on this reinflation story. Now, why is this important? Because if that's true, then yields will, will rise. OK, if yields do rise, then if I look, if you look, look at, look at, look at Tino, uh, sorry, look at the S&P here. The S&P is kind of right up at the top of, of you know, all-time highs. The all-time highs were set um, at the start of this week, uh, another little print higher, but we're kind of up around here. So you've actually got flat on the day so far on the futures, got a nice sort of doji here. But um, if you look at uh, the NASDAQ, then this gets a bit more interesting because the NASDAQ actually is printing down so far today. And in theory, what will happen here if yields do continue to rise, then this is potentially um, much more negative for the NASDAQ than, than it may be for the S&P. So it might be odd that people are thinking, well, hang on, if you've got the chance of bigger stimulus, shouldn't that be positive for stocks? And it certainly is for some stocks, but then it's not for others. And this is the thing about the tech sector particularly that's been on fire um, as we've been through this COVID 2020. And one of the reasons is that yields hit rock bottom. Now yields are rising again. One key thing here is a lot of these big giant tech firms are carrying massive cash stock uh, stockpiles. And the VAT, so we're talking about future cash flow here. Uh, when yields are really low, the value of this cash in the future is higher. And that's helped to fuel this NASDAQ rally. What's going to happen now if Biden wins and you get this reflation story and you get higher yields is these future cash piles become less valuable, which will negatively impact on the NASDAQ. Plus, on top of that, you've got the concern about um, increased regulation um, in the tech sector. And these two things in particular are why you're going to get the NASDAQ underperforming. If this story kind of plays out, obviously, we still need to wait for that second seat to be declared um, in the Senate and for officially that to be a kind of blue wave scenario. Do you think there's much, uh, when we're looking at the politics specifically, let's say the Democrats pick up both these Senate seats, there's a blue wave, it is still relatively tight and within their own political party there can obviously be left and right leaning members and if there is quite a left leaning policy that wants to be adopted by Biden, it wouldn't take a lot for it to, to yeah. be blocked. So is there a little bit of, there's obviously a very important technical area you just showed on the T note, which in itself a breach would likely create a fairly meaningful move there. But um, it, do, you, do you think there's any um, kind of short term reaction to, oh, wow, this has happened to then the realization that, well, perhaps it's not gonna be crazy levels of uh, types of policies because it'd be hard to still push them through even with full control of Congress or... Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I mean, that that control of the Senate is or would be on an absolute knife edge. Right. And you only need one, literally one dissenter. And then, of course, that 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 majority goes. And it's not even a majority, right? It, it would be 50-50 and, and yeah. with the vice president carrying the, the overriding vote. So it literally so, couldn't be a more slender sort of majority... So, yeah, so if I was a, a democratic kind of young gun in the party looking to make a bit of a splash myself for the future, I would see this actually quite a good opportunity for myself to cause perhaps a little bit of complication to uh, make sure that I, I can kind of secure what I want. Yeah, but I, I'd say for the I'd say for the short term. Yeah. Um, look, we weren't expecting this. If you go back a month, right, like in that kind of post election post-presidential election sort of aftermath, it was like, oh God, this, this is closer than we thought. Um, it turned out, all right, Biden's kind of striding away with it. But for a period there, we thought, hang on, this is a lot closer. Um, and then we were worrying, well, there's no chance of this blue wave. I mean, no one's been talking about blue wave for, for ages, right? So actually the, the, the mindset has shifted back. Okay, this is happening and that is positive. And I think that 
you know, certainly in the early weeks and months as Biden, you know, kind of goes through his inauguration um, in a couple of weeks, and then we actually get this democratic machine kind of um, in control, then I think, I don't think you're going to get many dissenters um, to start with. Um, I think, sure, as we get further into 2021, that might become a risk. But yeah. I think okay. the, the parties are so divided mm. at the moment. Politics is so bipolar at the moment that for a Democrat to go, actually, you know what, I'm going to vote with the Republicans, because of that divisiveness, that, that's a big gap to jump. And yeah. I think that's another important thing to, to, to put into the mix there. OK, well, look, let's leave uh, these charts for a moment and let's move on then to a different subject matter. And let's talk about COVID. Um, there's obviously been some significant developments, particularly here in the UK where we're based. But let me give you an up, up, to, up to speed on what some of the data there is and then in Europe. And then it'd be good to get your, your kind of comment on that. So the acceleration we've been seeing uh, in case rates in the UK, obviously very sharp post Christmas, New Year and so on. So likely to move even further north, resulting in this tier five uh, status at the moment. One in um, the new strain has been a key culprit of that mean that one person in every 50 now in England now has COVID-19. And that goes down to one in 30 if you're looking at London. Um, 1.3 million have had vaccine shots. That includes about 20% or so of over 80s. And this is in context of um, one of the things that I was talking about a lot in yesterday's uh, briefing was about the kind of ambitions that governments, not just the UK, but Europe and the US and how they've They've kind of moved the goalpost several times on the, the speed of uh, the rollout of these vaccines on the program. So Johnson's goal here is to vaccinate almost 14 million people, the highest risk uh, and carers by mid February. And that's the kind of timetable then. I think it, it's half term then the weeks around 22nd when they'll look to hopefully loosen the restrictions as the plan. But we've obviously been here many times before when uh, the dates kind of have rolled over. A um, couple of things here. The Guardian have reported this morning that COVID vaccine rollout might not hit target pace for another fortnight for a start. Whereas over in Europe at the moment, um, if you look at someone like Germany, for example, they've only immunized 0.3% of the population. So people have criticized the UK and US for being slow. They've done 1.4%. Germany have only done 0.3% and Germany yesterday prolonged their lockdown uh, until I think it's the end of this month. So yeah, what, what's your, your take yeah. on, on that and how markets are kind of, I mean, equity markets, I mean, although it's, they've shown a bit of weakness since the beginning uh, of this week, particularly on Monday, um, they're relatively high still. So yeah. what, is this a cause for concern or is it something you're looking at? It is. It's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because, you know, on the one hand, you've got the vaccine rollout starting, albeit some might argue false starting in terms of the speed of, of, of the initial phase. But then on the other hand, but, but, but still, look, vaccine being rolled out. And so the idea, great, perhaps this is the beginning of the end of this kind of COVID situation, at, at least for now, which clearly is a positive. But but just as you're getting this started, you're getting further lockdowns because you're getting cases ramping quite aggressively higher, you know, in the UK and, and now across Europe and this new variant. Is, and how do you play these two conflicting factors when it comes to thinking about how stocks um, might perform? I might bring up a chart here whilst I'm talking. I mean, you mentioned Germany, who are way behind the UK, although I say way behind, I mean, 0.3 percent of the population vaccinated in Germany compared to 1.3 in the UK. Don't, don't forget that both of those numbers are tiny. All right, these are these are minuscule numbers. All right, fine. 1.3 is higher than 0.3, but look, let's be honest, both are really small. And but look at this is the DAX. And the DAX, who, who you might say where you've got Germany literally announcing an extension of their lockdown last night, plus the fact that um, as we've just said, their vaccine program has got off a lot more slowly. Um, and yet here's the DAX, I mean, literally this morning, yeah. Um, or, well, sorry, this is a little bit off. This, no, this is on a weekly chart, isn't it? Let me go to a daily chart. I just wanted to get the, um, that, that high in place 
uh, so on a daily, yeah, we're not printing new highs. We did yesterday, but um, let me go back to the weekly because this is more important because technically we got this big top with back in February. And so, you know, we have seen the DAX make new all time highs this week, despite all that negative news. And I think what people are doing for now, they're happy to look through this uh, latest surge in cases and unfortunately then the associated follow on ramp up in death rates that we see. They're prepared to look through that on the belief that by the time we get to the spring, there will have this vaccine, you know, you're gonna have a double positive, which is that the vaccine rollout hopefully should have gathered momentum and we're getting millions of people vaccinated per week. Um, and then number two, the weather improves. Uh, and as we saw in the summer of 2020, of course, that helps with, with the virus. And, and then you're gonna be able to see in the spring and through the summer, you know, a, a significant enough portion of the population being vaccinated to avoid another winter spike at the end of 2021. So people are looking through this current, what looks to be, you know, aggressive exponential increases on the belief that it's going to be short term. Now you're going to get negative impact. We're, we're going to get a worse economic growth situation in quarter one of 2021 than we had previously thought and previously thought literally just a month ago. And that's because lockdowns have, have obviously come in. Um, but people are willing to look through that. Now it's all going to be about clearly the vaccine rollout. And, and the reason for some of the delays, I mean, you know, to be fair to politicians, this is an absolute, you know, Herculean uh, project that they're trying to get underway here. And you could argue, well, they should have been planning for this for, 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 for months and months and months and months and months. And of course they have, but, you know, some of the reasons for the slow rollout, stuff like, you know, the little glass files that the vaccine actually gets put into, well, now there's a global shortage of those. Of course there is, because suddenly you've got all these big, um, you know, healthcare companies, you know, creating loads of, so you've got, so you've got several issues that are several bottlenecks, let's call it. What I would look at is the testing as a kind of case study, the testing, uh, the speed of testing in the UK was really slow as we went through the summer and then actually suddenly it ramped up quite aggressively once they got their, their act together and once some of these bottlenecks were shifted, it did then actually rapidly uh, increase and I, and I would say we're going to hopefully see a situation like that. So I think mostly traders are looking beyond this current uptick in cases. They're looking beyond the slower than expected rollout of the vaccine on the understanding that things will sort itself out. And by the spring, we really will be able to see these global economies opening up, or at least the developed economies opening up. You know, you've got to remember the emerging markets are kind of further back in the queue when it comes to getting these uh, vaccines. But I think the developed economic world should open up as we come through spring and summer. And that's why markets are still priced at their highs. I mean, one, one thing here, is there, at the moment, Europe have been uh, really focusing on the vaccines from Pfizer specifically and BioNTech, not so much AstraZeneca, which obviously the UK were the first to kind of push through. Uh, and that's been rolled out since since this week on Monday. But um, shots in Europe, mainland Europe from Astra are not going to be available for a number of weeks at the very earliest. So does that, I mean... Yeah, I think that is a factor because uh, obviously the Pfizer one, uh, obviously it's going to be stored at a, a much lower temperature, which just clearly makes it, you know, really difficult to roll out rapidly because there's another massive bottleneck right there. I mean, how, how many... Have, how many vaccination facilities have got refrigeration equipment that's 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 capable of storing this stuff and, and so there's going to be another big bottleneck with the Pfizer one so look even though the AstraZeneca one look, a couple of weeks I mean look we've been in this pandemic for 12 months right 52 weeks almost um, so another two weeks think about it from an economic point of view another two weeks all right you wouldn't it's not ideal but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big an amount of time. And, and, and anyway, in another two weeks, some of these bottlenecks that's holding back on the UK side, hopefully will be alleviated. And that will help, you know, have a, have a more rapid uptake and roll out of the Astra um, vaccine in Europe. So that's, that's the way people are thinking.
But it could it could turn and it could be wrong. So this is why we're going to be monitoring. Obviously, the big stories now. Forget, you know, I know we've been obsessed about cases of, of COVID and deaths of COVID. Clearly, that's been the focus. I think actually 2021, big focus isn't going to be that. It'll be now that the new big figure is number of people vaccinated each day. Yeah, of which I'm pretty sure I read that there's going to be a Monday weekly update on that. Yeah. Which um, I guess is a bit of a double-edged sword because from a public perception, it's kind of, uh, it's transparency, it's up to speed, people know where we're at. But from a market's perspective, you kind of then, yeah, you're on the hook a little bit there. You've got to start yeah. meeting your expectations, I guess. So, well, look, let's, yeah. let's, let's move off that point and let's, um, let's look at a different different. Uh, area now let's talk about uh, OPEC plus so as we know then they've moved now to um, instead of semi-annually given the fluidity I guess of the global environment at the moment with COVID uh, they're going to meet every month and they had that meeting yesterday and what we saw was a surprise decision from the Saudis where they surprised the oil market with a large reduction in its oil output by 1 million barrels per day for February and March most people were just kind of going into this just okay yeah there's a bit of disagreement between Russia looking for a 500,000 increase but all in all we think that they'll get put down and they'll just hold pat as where they are and then Saudi come out with that information oil prices WTI moved up to 50 bucks um, Russia Kazakhstan meanwhile were allowed to bump up their output by a modest 75,000 in February and a further 75,000 in March. So no, those numbers are incredibly small on the latter, but obviously Saudi are doing the complete opposite. So what do you read into that um, from an OPEC perspective and a yeah. price perspective? Well, here's the chart. And as you're saying, um, you know, the explosion higher yesterday off the back of this news and we, and we kind of took out this key top. That, this is just a one hour chart, by the way, sorry. So just looking over the last week or so. We hit this little top um, start of the week, just shy of this $50 handle. And then the big news, and then we're up here and we're above, you know, we've been trading above 50. Um, I would say, to put this in perspective, uh, this is the most surprising OPEC meeting I've seen since November 2014 in terms of the actual outcome um, compared to kind of what we were expecting. When I say 2014, if you go back, I'm going to go back way back on the chart here to, to kind of bring that in. I know just kind of ignore this crazy negative print that we had back in April, but let, let me just kind of get that out of the way, actually, just to. Um, and, and so back in 2014, um, you, you might remember this is where the Saudis and, and OPEC decided, right, we need to take on the shale industry in the US. And to do that, we need to we need to drive prices lower. Um, and to make oil production, the more expensive oil production from, from shale, uh, economically unviable. And so Saudi flipped and actually said, even though price was dropping sharply, they said, you know what, we'll come out and we're going to increase production. This was a big surprise and it caused a big move. Okay. I, I can't get my, I just can't get my head around what's happened here. I, I, I don't get, let me go back to the one hour chart. I'm really shocked. Um, I'm trying to understand Saudi's kind of strategy here because. On the one hand, this is definitely negative for them uh, and positive for everyone else because they're kind of saying, all right, look, guys, we'll take the hit. We're going to cut by a million to prop up prices, which will benefit all you lot because you're not cutting production. Oh, and Russia, you know, yeah, we don't mind. You can increase production. It's um, far removed from some of the um, decision making we've seen in, in recent years. And so it's almost like uh, the best Christmas present, the best sort of New Year present that Saudi could have given. It's interesting because um, at the same time, the Saudis have also kind of re-engaged with Qatar. So uh, that politically, there seems to be, I don't know, it's almost like they've woken up at the start of 2021 and said, you know what, let's change. Let's just kind of change our direction here. And uh, let's actually go now in a different direction. And that might have kind of contributed to their decision here on oil. But so I, I'm really, really shocked as you can see the market is. So what happens here on price? Well, again, it's slightly difficult because you could, there's always those glass half empty analysts who will say, well, hang on a minute. Why have they done that? Surely they know something we don't. Right, and on, Isn't that, on this... that point, Goldman Sachs last night right. said exactly that. They see yeah. the surprise move as a signal, oil demand is to weaken 
and subsequently GS have cut their oil demand forecast for January and February. They also said the transition to a probably less friendly US administration might also have led the Saudis to adopt a more supportive stance toward other Middle East producers. Right. So, look, you've got look, you've got surprise extended lockdowns in Europe. Okay, that wasn't in the equation a month ago. Now, clearly, from an oil demand point of view, that's definitely very negative for the short term. Okay, so it kind of makes sense from that point for Saudi to go. All right. Yes, demand in the first two months of 2021 is going to be a lot less than we expected. Right, let's cut production to make sure we're controlling price and keeping it up here. That makes sense. What doesn't make sense is that the rest of OPEC weren't particularly keen. Russia actually wants to hike. And what, what further doesn't make sense is the Saudis went, all right, then fine, we'll cut. You guys don't have to. That, that's the big kind of shift here in, in the kind of dynamic between these parties, where the Saudis have said, look, we'll take the hit. So look, it could be, there's definitely going to be less demand in the first three months than we had anticipated because of these lockdowns, that's for sure. Goldman's are saying, well, look, it's a chronic drop in demand, way beyond anything that we, we, we were concerned about. That's why Saudi have been forced into this incredibly unusual move. And I guess time will tell, we'll find out, but, um, you know, in the meantime, if there is a crash and a chronic lack of demand and that extends, well then, you know, maybe you're going to get the other OPEC nations, you know, on board with extending cuts. Uh, but I think for me, from a price point perspective, look, we're up around 50. Today's really important. What happens at $50? Now we're here, you can see it's created a little bit of a, you know, we hit 50 at 3 p.m. yesterday, okay? And if I... You know, if I go back to a weekly chart, you know, this is this is the highest price points that we've seen since February. You got key the key bottoms throughout 2019 at this level. I don't need I don't need to tell you how important $50 is as as a price. It, it's it's obviously massive, and so that's why today and this week to a, to a degree are really important. What happens now? We're at 50. Do we get a, a break of 50 and a uh, and does that become a key support level or is 50 a, a resistance barrier uh, and we kind of pull back in? And I think personally, I think we'll probably tick higher. We're also getting dollar weakness to add into the mix. Um, so as a result of this kind of Biden situation, you're getting a, another extension of the dollar weakness situation, which is a positive for oil. If I quickly switch over to, to the euro dollar here, um, you know, we've got this, this kind of key uh break of a trend that everyone's been talking about well where do i draw it you could draw it there really so you've got a key break here and then people are eyeing up the 125 handle of course and that, and that kind of top that we had back in 2018 and so you've got a further extension of dollar weakness which definitely also helps to support oil up here so my, my view is that really real surprise from the saudis and in the short term it may well see us drift up above 50 bucks do we stay above 50 that'll be more about the vaccine rollout and how effective it is, and therefore how quickly economies open up again, and then how quickly that whole whole demand story turns turns more positive. Okay, great. Well, look, this um, just wrapping things up. Then, just to summarise the rest of the day going forward, we've got the EU UK uh, service PMIs. These are final readings, so not likely to be market moving. You've got the German state CPIs anything there you would look at i mean they were obviously negative previous months um yeah so i think inflation it's, figures in in europe i think it's too early for europe to, mm. to really start to see any evidence of this reinflation story that i mentioned earlier i think you're gonna certainly the us will be leading that um so i i think i, I, don't, I don't think you're going to see anything different in these regional German CPIs um, yet. So I don't think this data will, will cause any surprise. Okay, and then uh, we've got factory orders this afternoon from the US, the oil inventory numbers following the APIs last night, uh, which probably pale insignificant to the decision yesterday as Piers yeah. was discussing. And then we've got the FMC minutes uh, this evening. But one final question for you then, Bank of England Governor, uh, Bailey is speaking later, but this is just in front of the Treasury Select Committee about the financial stability report. So it's kind of an off topic thing that's not normally market moving. Yeah, we just had Brexit. 
and um, the rate rates market is showing a little bit of apprehension at the moment, given the lockdowns and the, the UK specifically COVID situation and this idea of negative interest rates is kind of re-emerging a little bit. Um, any thoughts on that at this point? Um, yeah, firstly, I don't think he'll talk about that today. So yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't know, he's still relatively new as the governor. So uh, I guess we're not quite as certain about that as, it, as we might have been if, let's say, Carney was in the seat. But, um, you know, these guys are professional. He's not going to be He's not going to be drawn into making comments on that today because that's not the topic. So I don't think we're going to get any market moving events due to UK monetary policy um, information flow today. But um, yeah, more broadly, you know, negative rates. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a hard one, and, and I, I always go back to the point that uh, for me now as a trader, uh, uh, do I? Do I care about whether the Bank of England go negative on rates or not? Do, do I care? Uh, and to be honest, no. And that's because if they do go negative on, on rates, all right, that would, could be a symbolic, obviously clearly historic moment, but does it really change anything? Um, you know, other European countries have had negative rates for, for years. Um, does it really change anything in the short to medium term? Not for me, and for me, without a shadow of a doubt, it's not in the UK. Monetary policy is not a big factor in when I think about how markets are going to behave this year. It's definitely about uh, it's definitely about the vaccine rollout. That's it. That's the big ticket. If the vaccine rollout. You could. It's crazy to say, but we've literally just had Brexit, and you know what? It doesn't matter. Yeah. But from a market's point of view. Certainly in quarter one of 2021 and beyond, just it just pales into insignificance alongside whether this vaccine is going to get rolled out effectively or not. On that note, Piers Curran, head of trading and by trading. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I'll let Enjoy you go the, day. the rest of your day. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers. Bye.